Once again, another lecture in our series, The Many Faces of Integration. And tonight, our topic is the Negro's point of view, its historical development, and its demands today. Now, obviously, this is an extremely large topic on which much has already been written and much more will be written in the future. So in a way, to ask a man to dispose of this topic in one hour is quite an assignment. Fortunately, I was able to convince Professor Jones, Professor Wendell P. Jones of our Department of Education to do this lecture for the faculty series. Professor Jones is Southern educator through the master's degree, which he earned at Atlanta University, Atlanta, Georgia. He got his PhD from the University of Chicago. He has been at UCLA since 1958 and teaches courses in comparative education and African education. He serves as campus coordinator for two education projects in Nigeria, which UCLA is helping to develop under contract with the U.S. Agency for International Development. His prior experience has included teaching in public schools and colleges in several southern states and work with the National Education Association from which he came to UCLA. He has had extensive travel in Africa studying educational development. Indeed, he just returned days ago from Nazaland in Africa, where he assisted in educational survey of the country conducted by an American Council on Education team. Also last year, Professor Jones received one of the most coveted awards here at UCLA, one of the Distinguished Teaching Awards, which are given by the UCLA Alum Alumni Association. However, the selection of the uh, people to receive the awards is made by committees composed of faculty people. Professor Jones received this award because he is a dedicated teacher, an able, competent teacher, and also I am sure because he has those warm qualities as a man which make him not only a competent but an excellent teacher. I have known Professor Jones very shortly, really. We've been on this campus for a long time, but I have never had occasion to meet him until quite recently. And I too, as so many other people on our campus, have been, have been charmed by this very remarkable man. I am very happy to present to you Professor Jones. Better before than after. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I have but one comment to make these very nice introductory remarks one is prone to hear these days. Now that my mother is in perhaps the last years of her life at 82, I merely regret that she cannot be in North Carolina, in California rather than North Carolina, and hear these nice things said of her son. <laughs> and when I make my occasional visits back to that area, she refuses to believe that people have said the things of me that do happen to be said. <laughs> when I first... <laughs> when I first... Louder? Yes. Then perhaps I should leave the microphone. <laughs> when I first uh, was invited to participate in this series on one of what I consider uh, the more crucial issues facing America today, I was a bit hesitant, primarily because I, as a Negro, had been asked to discuss the Negro's point of view. Not only its demands today, but also its, the, its uh, historical origins, its historical roots. As one who would like to be an educator, I have not had the time to look at Negro development as an historian would, and I felt that I would be handicapped in bringing you the historical overview 
that might be good in looking at the Negro's demands today. More recently, when I really became involved in trying to find something to say to this group tonight, I became convinced that I was right and that I might very well have withdrawn from this particular series. On the other hand, not having the historical competence, more or less, but having come through something of the mill, shall we say, I could feel with Dingolino there was a kind of responsibility to share my own impressions of the demands of today with those of you who have interest enough in this total problem to be present on this evening. It is from this frame of reference that I will gallop perhaps through some of the history of the American Negro in American society, focusing more or less on the continuing protest he has been making as regarded his status in American society, and hoping that you will have a slightly heightened appreciation of his attitudes today, of the course he has chosen today, and of the goals he really is working towards. When we read of Birmingham, of Montgomery, of Little Rock, of Maryland, of Los Angeles, and all of the racial conflict that seems to go on, we are prone to feel that at long last the Negro is stretching forth his arms, is demanding things. Now, this is a new phase in the life of the American Negro. This is not exactly true. If one would bother to read such persons as John Hope Franklin or Benjamin Quarles, are some of the non-racially oriented historians. It would soon come to a realization that from the time of the first entry of Negroes upon American soil, there has been a protest against the status accorded him. It is reflected in the numerous slave riots it is reflected in the runaways who sought either through the underground railroad or on means of their own to move from the bonds of slavery into what they thought were the states of freedom. It is found likewise in the laws that were passed in pre-Civil War days, in our so-called Southern states, to inflict serious and hard punishment upon those who would seek to escape the chains of the masters. It is reflected also in the spirit of slaves who worked after normal working hours that they might earn the funds with which they could purchase freedom. Scattered through the South today are Negroes, prominent Negroes, whose parents bought their freedom, whose great-grandparents happened to be the slaves of masters who were sympathetic with the desire of a man to be free, to determine his own fate, to chart his own course. This kind of protest against inequality, against deprivation, has been characteristic of the American Negro since he first came to these shores. This kind of protest has extended into today, taking perhaps slightly different, perhaps more direct 
perhaps more mass forms in modern society than it did before. For when one considers the numbers of former Africans and their descendants who were in the bonds of slavery, the numbers of those who actively engaged in the protest really were few. At one time, the black American constituted about 21% of America's population. But as the immigrants came in from Western Europe, and as the Negro lost even his actual population count through early death, through other kinds of cruelty, the percentage that Negroes were of the total population tended to decline. Only in recent decades has there been a reversal of this trend. But through all of these years, there have always been Negroes, Africans, or whatever you would call them, who have clamored for freedom. Freedom of action, freedom of decision, freedom of movement, freedom to participate in all aspects and areas of American life. And through all of these years, there have been elements in the majority population, Caucasian, who were willing to go against the grain of the masses of the whites to assist Negroes in their struggle for freedom or liberation. There were abolitionists. One is prone to think of such persons as Frederick Douglass and what have you. But this kind of task that he took for himself, he could not do alone. So there were abolitionists of another race, of the Caucasian race, William Lloyd Garrison, and others of that metal, who worked along with him. And so the struggle persisted. And actually, the Negro somewhat accommodated himself to the existing situation without really losing sight of a goal he had decades ago. Even though during the period of slavery, during the period immediately following slavery, the percentage of the Negro population involved in the active struggle for a change in status may have been low, certainly lower than it is now. Yet during this period, when he sought release from the pains of his status through song, through drama, through religion, there remained as an undercurrent, as an undergirding, the goal. And it was never fully lost sight of. With emancipation, it became more possible for him to seek the freer area without the fear he had had as a slave. And there began the mass exodus of Negroes from the former slave-holding states to the free states. He thought the, green, the grass in the more distant place would be greener. He thought that this would give him the utopia. And there was a mass exodus from our southern states, and the exodus has not ended yet. But he found, once he was in New York, once he was in Michigan, once he was in California, that the grass was not quite as green as he had hoped it might be. Ghettos developed. 
He became the last man hired and the first man fired. Community services came to his area after they had been in other areas. Schools for him were not as well taken care of nor as adequately staffed as for other people. And so the protest continued. Really, the first of the major lawsuits regarding equality of educational opportunity was not based in our glorious South, but in our Puritan Massachusetts. Yet he was able, in Massachusetts, to file the initial suit. There was another kind of freedom there, though not the complete freedom that he really looked forward to. During this swing of time, there were leaders, all kinds of leaders. And I think one thing the Negro hopes for is the day when there will be no Negro leaders. There were those who felt that we might very well accommodate to the existing situation and make the best of it. That we might in this process develop certain particular skills that would ensure us a reasonable role within the society. Perhaps Booker T. Washington and Tuskegeeism would fall in this category. And there were those who felt we should not so limit ourselves, but that we should aim for the full gamut, and particularly that we should look to the higher levels of life. And perhaps in this category would have fallen those who were subscribers to the theories and ideas of William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. And then there were those who felt, as time went on, that perhaps we did not belong here anyway. That since we had been exposed to some of the customs of a so-called civilized nation, we might very well exclude ourselves from it and form a nation of our own. The Garveyites, for example. Remove yourself. Take what you may have picked up. Blend it in with your heritage. Create great nations of your own. But the American Negro, who had been in the country for decades, for scores of years, knew no other country. This is his. This is his homeland. And in masses, they were not willing to make this transition. And so they stayed and sought to make the best of a situation. The best of a situation has been a continuing protest against that which did exist. You had the rise, I said, of the leaders the independents, some of whom in the course of years were looked upon by the majority population as those who could wield the massive influence over the massive Negro. And perhaps never in the history of any minority group has a person, a single person, been as influential and as powerful with the powers that were, as Booker T. Washington was, from 1895 to 1915. No Negro got a reputable appointment government-wise in the United States without his sanction. And even for the southern states, many a chap who aspired, though white, to a postmastership, didn't get it because Booker T. Washington didn't think he should have it. His power was great. That era more or less passed, for he was challenged, very seriously challenged. And once the challenge became serious, then others could spring up. And never again will we really have the one single leader who speaks 
for the entire mass of Negro America. And this is good. For Negro America is not a block. Rather, it is an element of the population with various segments, segments which think for themselves, which choose routes they should like to follow and do not wish to be dictated to. In fact, they won't be. But this same Negro, who had been under the influence of persons like Washington and Du Bois, was able to join in with an organization that Du Bois founded. An organization that said we will not get too far through riots or even through escaping the area we have known best. We may get somewhere through a constant, a continuing appeal to the courts of this country. For really, the theory went, America is established upon certain basic principles and her court decisions cannot indefinitely and without penalty violate those basic principles. So many could join an organization such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and rejoice in the slow process that led to certain significant and favorable court decisions. And others could support something like the National Urban League, also a product of this century which sought not action through the courts, but the medium of persuading people that economic opportunity afforded the Negro meant an advance in the economic structure of America in general. In both of these instances, the NAACP and the National Urban League, well-meaning persons of the white race were strong supporters, both in action and in finance. These were not alone, and this was not the only avenue that well-meaning whites pursued in an effort to push the American Negro to a status of equality. The early so-called Negro colleges, Hampton Institute, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, Wilberforce in Ohio, Fisk University, Talladega College and what have you, Atlanta University, were staffed for the most part with a very high caliber of Caucasian. I happen to be a product of, those two, of two of those institutions, indirectly, second generation. My mother having gone to Knoxville College in Tennessee, a graduate of the class of 1908, and who met that year the first Negro professor the institution had ever employed. My father having gone to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania who until the time of his graduation in 1909 was never taught by a Negro. The staffs were of what one might call the fine, liberal, New England, Caucasian stock. And here was a definite contribution to the protest movement. But time moves on. And the slow conservative approach of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the persistent persuading of the National Urban League happened not to be enough. The American Negro sticks through the elementary school, in large part goes to secondary school, and in proportion in terms of those who finish 
secondary school and within the Negro race and those who finish within the white race in southern states, he flocks to higher institutions. Not always the best, of course not. For in that particular setting, sometimes his institution was judged under a dual standard. You would, uh, an accrediting body would have one set of rules for the white institution and another set of rules for the Negro institution. Not that the Negro wanted this, but it was simply what existed. But he went, and his view was broadened. His tastes were lifted. And then there came these Supreme Court decisions regarding higher education from the 30s on. And this has perhaps been covered in another lecture, so I skip it hastily. But many of these same persons took advantage of adjustments the southern states were willing to make and moved into your northern universities and earned master's and doctor's degrees in academic disciplines. They earned professional degrees in law, in medicine, in architecture, and what have you. For there was a deep faith within the American Negro that if there's no other way to break these continuing bonds, we may do it through education. And many a woman, including the mother of Ralph Bunch, has labored late into the night in menial tasks that the son or the daughter might have the advantage of education. But that turned out not to be the answer either. For an eminently qualified Negro, time after time, would see himself turn back when a less qualified person would get the job. But he went to war in World War II, as he had done in World War I. He did his bit. He accepted almost anything dropped his way in an accommodating manner. For World War I. But by World War II he was changing and he wasn't quite willing to accept it all. And even within the armed forces you had continuing riots and it became a little bit of a joke that if things don't go right you'll contact Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> and it did some good. And while he fought the war on the various fronts there were the rumblings of a change in the, the approach of certain established organizations like the National Urban League. People like Lester Granger were beginning to say, but we've got all this new industry, war industry, and we are just getting the crumbs from the table. Why? And so he initiated the moves that eventually produced the president's order regarding equal or fair employment in these industries directly connected with the war effort. It's a step ahead, a part of the protest movement. Then the war ended, and we came back in droves. We had seen other things, we had stretched our wings, we knew that America was a power in terms of the world, and we thought America might be a power in terms of a tenth of its own citizens. And we decided upon a new tactic. We felt that there should be more direct action, that our demand should be heard, really heard, that we ought to make whatever impact we could make in these, shall we say, crucial years, rather than wait interminably for the utopia. Who knows but that we were wrong, and who knows but that we were right. Times are never the same, and there is really no yardstick by which to judge the exact direction in which a minority group or a deprived group or a group suffering inequality should move. 
And so there arose a new spirit within the American Negro. A spirit demanding direct action. The sort of thing you hear about and read about in the sit-ins, in the wait-ins, in the march-ins, in all the ends. But let's get in. And we can read of these things. They're really rather recent. And we skip a key period in this total evolution or development. We forget that there were many things that happened between 1945 and 1955 which never made the headlines of our big newspapers. We forget the small communities to which Negroes returned with different points of view. We forget the small associations and clubs and groups that made certain demands such as pave the street, our kids will walk on the way to school and were turned down. We forget small voters groups in small towns that would go 10 strong to register as voters and be turned down. We forget high school graduates unable to go to college, reasonably competent, who would seek posts as clerks, or who would request to take an examination to serve as a stamp seller in a United States post office and be turned down. We forget healthy men who would hear that a new road was being built and would go out seeking employment to learn they had not joined the union, who would turn to join the union and find that it was closed to them. We forget Negro veterans guaranteed a loan for a house, provided a bank would underwrite it, and who could find no bank that would be willing to take up the deal. And something began to happen. And there came a kind of unanimity of feeling that if you don't move now, you're lost forever. In a sense, there was a grassroots uprising. It was not a dentist or a physician or a teacher who set off things in Birmingham. It was a domestic servant. It was not a lawyer or a congressman or a big businessman in Greensboro, North Carolina, who began the sit-ins, it was a mere college student working his way through the Agricultural and Technical College in Greensboro. But what those people did could catch fire because the total circumstance had set the stage for mass action. And the significant difference between the earlier protests and today's protests Rest in the fact, I feel, that what is happening today is really a grassroots expression. It represents a feeling that has permeated all of Negro America. And the permeation is so great, and the devotion to the cause is so intense, that Negro America has no dreams of relinquishing it until the outward appearances, at least of inequality, are removed. Actually, it's my personal conviction that had there been a positive, a notably positive reaction to the demands of the sit-ins, that he might never have got as far as he anticipates going now. But when you had the sit-ins, when you had the buy-ins, when you had people seeking decent housing, the resistance from the majority group was so very, very great until it pointed up to the Negro that he would have to fight or be forever submerged. You perhaps 
have no concept of what it does to you, to you as an American to see 2,000 people refusing one child admission to a school. It is a little hard to view people spitting on children or as is almost now the fad, unleashing dogs. But it does something to your total sensitivity. And in the process it unifies the Negro in his struggle for equality. It also, as a grassroots thing, alerts the older Negro to what he must do if he would maintain status with the emerging Negro. He cannot pursue his conservative, time-taking role as before. He must be more active. It likewise awakens or quickens the majority group. It makes some in the majority group really look closely at the situation and believe that we must come to a solution. For what is going on here involves the whole future of America. And if we choose not to go the right path, we endanger what Lincoln has called the last best hope of Earth. And so you find a significant element of the white population, totally sympathetic with the aspirations of the Negro as a group. The, the August 28 March on Washington indicated this to a marked degree. It was not a march of Negroes. It was a march of America. All races, majority and minority groups, were represented. None of the battles we seek to fight are fought with Negro money alone. We have the advantage in a sense of the talents of other groups and for this we are grateful. But we are aware of something that despite those who are well-meaning many of whom sit before me, there remains a hard core within the country, white, that really does not wish the Negro to know true freedom, that really does not wish him to have the opportunity to purchase a home as he will, where he may, if he can pay for it, that tends to become emotional and think that any kind of association, physical or otherwise, leads to intermarriage and to mongrelization of the Caucasian race. <laughs> Even though in this great country one can hardly force himself into marriage, and even though, within a family such as mine, one finds all shades of pigment. I'm part of the darker element. And one remembers these things, but make, takes them not too seriously. For the Negro as such, in his protest today, has come to the conclusion, I feel, that what he wants would not be a social situation. What he really wants is a fair chance of what the country has to offer. What he really wants is to be a participating, fully participating American citizen. This is all. A job exists? Consider me fairly for it. A house is available for purchase by Americans, consider my application for the purchase of that house fairly. 
A school exists for the education of American youth. Consider the application of my child for enrollment in that school, just as you would the application of anyone else. There's not much more he wants. It is not that he wishes to bed after six. In fact, he's a little fearful that that wish might be greater on the other side with the male population, as history tends to have shown. All he's after is a chance to get in the mainstream of American life as an individual. He is fully aware that there are Negroes who do not take advantage of the opportunities, education-wise and otherwise, that America has to offer. He also knows that there are Caucasians in this same boat. He is fully aware that he does not wish to live next door to every Negro. And he is fully aware that Caucasians do not wish to live next door to every Caucasian. But he would like to feel that no, no curtain drops in front of him because he is a Negro. Let it drop because he is an individual. And if he is an individual before whom the curtain should not drop, don't let it drop. He has reached a point that he rather bemoans the onlys. It has become something of a fad in American society to point to the, ad to the advance of the American Negro in terms of those who have achieved key positions in American society. So long as you can name the great singer, so long as you can name the great educator, so long as you can name the few lawmakers who sit in interracial settings, who hold their own there creditably, the problem will not be solved. We look to the day, more or less, when there are no onlys. He's the only Negro in the office of the recorder of deeds. He's the only Negro on the staff of the mayor. He's the only Negro. This is no longer a significant distinction. But when comes the time that we can forget these things, then the Negro will begin to feel that he has won his battle. But so strong is his determination to move down these lines, so there will hardly be any letting up of effort. Oh, it's easy to think of the Muslim movement. It does exist. It is not to be taken too lightly. But it is but another effort, really, to focus on the fact that we are not part and parcel of the stream of American life. It has a following, largely in major cities of the United States. And it has some virtues. It has done some good. But it is not, or its goals are not the goals of a majority of the American Negroes. Not even the goals of a significant minority of American Negroes. The American Negro does not wish to be separate. But he does wish an integration. An integration not to be misinterpreted as a purely social thing, as the kind of thing that produces the mongrelization. Rather, he wishes the integration that will permit the total society to look at him simply as another American, as an individual, ready to advance. When you look at 500 schools in Chicago and you look at 15 principals who are of Negro descent in Chicago, when you look at the qualifications of Negroes who are teaching in the public schools of Chicago, who hold all the credentials necessary for administrative posts, whose relatives, shall we say, in color, constitute more than 50% of the school enrollment in Chicago, 
And yet they can't get but 15 principal ships out of 500. Do you expect them to sit still? No, not anymore. The era of the accommodationist is over. The era of the active protester is with us. The conscience of this country has been pricked. And we tend to accept the fact that we need to do more. And we move slowly in that direction. Complicated by our politics. Complicated by the diehards within the majority group. Many of whom wield tremendous power of one sort or another. Complicated by the impression or the image that America makes outside our boundaries and hoping all the time that the panacea will present itself without effort. It will never happen. The beauty of the present situation perhaps rests in the fact that a significant, major, and important element in the majority group is aware of the total situation and is anxious to do something about it. This is true not just in the halls of Congress, I don't know whether they fit this category or not, but in the large cities, the medium-sized cities, the small towns, and the villages of America. It is positively true. The other part that is pretty about this is that the total situation has given the Negro a heightened appreciation of the Negro and has tended to unify him. The unified Negro, though the goals of particular groups may be slightly different, coupled with the well-intentioned members of the majority group may provide the answer to this problem. But as it stands now, we somewhat have the spirit that Claude McKay had in the late twenties, what some people like to call the the Renaissance of, Ameri of Negro art. When he wrote some lines, it ran something like this. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pact, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. In a sense, that is the spirit of today's Negro. On the other hand, Today's Negro has the hope that Langston Hughes expressed just a few years back when he said, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare to say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. For I, too, am an American. And that is the hub of the protest. See me as an individual, as an American. No more, no less. Simply an American. Thank you. As customary, we'll now have some questions for our speaker. The Jones, would you entertain some questions, please? I'm prone not to accept the hand I see. It's one of my favorite students, Mr. Bakate. <laughs> I mean, I started more in the 
Uh, that is a, an item that is not too simple to answer. There is a prevailing belief, I should think, in the country that the Negro race has been bolstered in its strength, in its beliefs for itself, by the emergence of African states on the threshold of independence and actually into the field of international relations. As an there is no way to prove that this is true. Um, as much as I am reluctant to say so, I think that the African has felt a closer kinship to the American Negro than the American Negro has to the African. A bunch of factors are at work there. But certainly, when you go back to 38 to 39, whenever it was that uh, Italy overran Ethiopia, the Negro reacted very, very pro-Ethiopia and was to a degree rebuffed by Ethiopia. But I think the Negro has rejoiced in the emergence of African states on the international scene. And psychologically, they may have received a shot in the arm from the fact that these states, not as long exposed to education and advantage, as the American Negro has been exposed, were able to achieve independence and self-government. And this may be, I concede, a part of the protest movement of the 50s. In my opinion, there's no documentation. I realize there has been a considerable bit of talk in recent uh, years, very recent years, of compensatory education, compensatory hiring, and what have you. And I also understand that there's considerable disagreement within the Negro group down this line. One can say that because you have deprived me and have decided to give me an opportunity, you should make an extra effort to make me right in the same sense that we provide special facilities for the retarded child in school. I will have to give you my personal reaction to this uh, concept. I do not buy it. I think in the long run, it is not necessary. Dean Galindo indicated that I was Southern educated through the master's degree, this is quite true. My father before me had a touch of not so Southern education. But it has been the position more or less of what one might call the thinking Negro population that this double standard business is not a healthy business. We have fought as much as we could a double standard in the accreditation of so-called Negro colleges and universities. It has gone by the mill now. Personally, I feel that there are many Negroes, many, many Negroes, fully trained for positions who are denied them and who need no remedial work. Personally, I feel that once the atmosphere has so changed that the bright high school graduate can believe there is a place for him if he is qualified, that there will be absolutely no occupational areas in American life which he will not enter. When I was going to school, I would have been most reluctant to pursue corporation law. I hope this is not the fate of my nephews, if you get what I mean. Yes. I wonder what you think of Warren Miller's recent statement that there is no room for the white right liberal in the capacity of leadership in the Negro movement. I noticed from personal experience within the movement that there is considerable indifference, if not antagonism, 
Schwartz had to fight leadership. I'm not exactly willing to comment on Mr. Miller's statement, not knowing the full context. Nevertheless, I think I can add this little bit about the con general concept of the white liberal. In this uh, period of active protest, I'm quite sure that many Negro leaders have come to feel that the white liberal, who was far ahead of his time 25 years ago, is a trifle behind his time now. Um, I think this is very real, and this is not to degrade the white liberal. It is that he may be seeing things slightly differently from the Negro leadership of today. He may be seen, he really may be more of a moderate in the sense of the pace at which he would like to see things accomplished. His heart may be gold, but for the Negro on the move, who really wants action yesterday, he is too slow. I'm, I'm not communicating. quite as fast as uh, some of the most uh, progressive of the Negroes? Unfortunately, well, I, uh, unfortunately, they seem not to have quite enough power. <laughs> Is there someone else? I'm going to try to reconcile your last statement with the previous one, that you would stand at the point where the relinquishment of uh, the appearance of discrimination took place. It seemed to me that you're stopping far short. I am. I am willing to stop at the point where the appearance of discrimination takes place. Well, I can't remember my statements, but I, I'm not quite sure that that is what I meant anyway. Sure. <laughs> What did I say? I am willing to stop at the point where the appearance... <laughs> can't possibly have said that. Will you say that again, please? I hate to take your time. You would not stop until at least... Well, I would agree with you. <laughs> totally. Remember the context in which you said it. Well, if there be no more questions, may I say yes? I believe, really, I'm not sure, and I hate, in terms of the rest of the people, I believe that the church has been rather adequately covered a little bit earlier in another one of these sessions. I have formed a very considerable respect for Mr. A. Philip Landau, the president of the Speaking Car Porters Association, uh, way from the Union. Today, the uh, radio news carried a, what was called a quotation from him, which, as I remember, stated that before the integration problem is settled, blood will flow across the line. I hope he was misquoted. I, I mean blood in any considerable Mom. <laughs> I, I, I mean to say, uh, an occasional uh, individual has been uh, uh, killed. Uh, there has been blood from dog uh, fangs and so forth. But it seemed to indicate that uh, there were rather extensive bloodletting. 
Uh, I, I hope uh, it will never come to that, and I would like to have your comments. I have purposely refrained from referring to the 10 or 12 people whose quotes attract considerable public attention in the United States. I'm referring to Negroes. Partly because I sympathize with those individuals in the efforts they are making to push forward the status of the Negro. And the whole business, it is sometimes necessary for them as leaders to make statements that serve certain ends. I think it's far more important to look at the end goal to which all of those persons are working. I'm reminded of the same young man, Mr. Ibaka, who raised the first question, who was in Los Angeles at the time of the last Democratic National Convention, said to me the next day, I can't quite understand American politics. I asked why. And he said, well, I watched this thing on television. One man was saying the other chap was too young and too inexperienced to dare lead a country. And the other fellow was saying the man was too old and bald-headed to have the nerve to try to lead a country. <laughs> and the next day they had arms locked around each other's shoulders, saying each was the best possible for the position he was to do. <laughs> it was quite true. But sometimes in the whole picture, statements are made. And sometimes, these aren't seen in the full context. I'm tempted to guess what was meant. This would be wrong. But I think we can go a little bit beyond and look at, and one treads on treacherous ground here. There has been bloodshed in America. It occurred in 1800 and it's occurring in 1900. And it had its roots in racial disturbances. There can be bloodshed, more bloodshed, in America than we've had in the past few years. There's a thing they have in psychology that they call role playing. And sometimes I wish that people could put themselves in the role of the American Negro. If you could possibly put yourself in the role of the school teacher whose daughter died in that bombing of a church in Alabama, would you want to contribute to the shedding of blood? When you stop and realize there have been more than a hundred such bombings, and almost infinitesimal is the count of those cases where the bomber has been apprehended. There are brilliant Negroes in this country, but I'm wondering, you can't help but wonder, how many bombings instigated by Negroes would not be run down to the very purchase of the bomb? If this sort of thing continues, it is not inconceivable that American will stand against American. God help that it might not happen, that people like this audience will prevent its happening. But I refer to the hard core of resistance. 